Hey, good morning. Good morning. So today we are going to switch over to a new programming language. Up to this point, for the first eight weeks, we did C. So C++ is going to be what we are going to be studying the rest of the semester. And the reason why we want to pick it up here is because the idea behind C++ is building upon what is known as object-oriented programming. Now you had your first kind of brush with objects last week when we were starting to dig into structs. So a struct has different private members. Well, sorry, you can see it's public members, but these members could be defined together and put onto the data heap. And so now it became, well, if we can combine things together, are there ways that we can uh, define how they all work together in a more concise way? And how can we make them all work together in a way that aids our computational thinking? So the first thing I want to do before we even dig in to what C++ is and the differences between C++ and C, I want to emphasize something. The difference between C and C++ is an inherently philosophical difference. And because of this, some of you are going to look at C and C++ in very different ways. So Bjarne Straussjöp, I have a picture of him here, uh, invents uh, C++ in 1979. At the time, he calls it C with classes. And he wasn't inspired by trying to make the program work better. He was inspired by the uh, philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard. And he, more importantly, why he thought his philosophy was not good. And he has this exact quote here. I find Kierkegaard's almost fanatical concern for the individual and keen psychological insights much more appealing than the grand oy schemes and concern for humanity in the abstract of Hegel and Marx. And so what he's hitting on here is this idea of trying to force people into, quote, doing what is good for them. He says, this is the cause of so much suffering in the world. And some of you go, yeah, Dr. Morrison made me suffer a lot in the first few assignments of the semester. I totally agree with what uh, uh, Bjarne is talking about here. But what, he's talk what he is specifically talking about is this idea that forcing programming as a purely procedural idea is ideologically limited. And so he creates C++ as a way to build upon C in a way that allows them to be able to implement ideas by developing these classes and objects. And he says, many C++ design decisions have their roots in my dislike for forcing people to do things in some particular way. Where ideals clash and sometimes even pundits seem to agree, I prefer to provide support that gives the programmers a choice. So he sees C as ideologically limited. And then he tries to build upon this. It's an improvement upon C, C plus one, hence C plus plus. And he says it enables programmers to write real world programs that are simultaneously elegant, efficient, raise this idea of levels of abstraction. So we saw this a little bit when we started working in structs, right? So when we had a, in the lab that we were working on this weekend, you are reading in a, an array of structures that contain a first name, a last name, and a double for a midterm and a final exam, right? So when we were using structures and you're using that specific format, you no longer had to allocate the memory and do all the pointers. And when you read it to fscanf, you were uh, you passed a string to fscanf and passing it by reference by default. So a lot of this memory allocation that you have to do is starting to be abstracted away from you. It's getting a little less complex or we're starting to get that Margaret Hamilton's book down a little bit. And so he even says his goal was to improve the working lives of hundreds of thousands of serious programmers. And in 1985, the idea of hundreds of thousands of programmers as opposed to the millions that we have on earth today uh, 
was much more realistic. So he's trying to aim to make this world a better place for everybody who was programming back then. So what is the idea of object-oriented programming? And what the four main concepts that I'm really going to hammer home for the rest of the semester are encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. I'm going to define all of these in today's lecture. But first, in order to understand all these, we have to kind of think about what the world is like, not what the program is like. So the world is full of objects. You know, for example, I'm holding disinfectant, right? And if I were to unscrew this disinfectant and spill it all over, right? There are several things that would happen when I would do this. I have to account for gravity. I have to account for how fast things go. I have to account for what's in the bottle. And then I have to account for what will happen when the disinfectant hits the desk. So there are certain things that can splash. If this wasn't disinfected, this is some sort of other chemical material that were to actually spill in here, I could potentially create some burns. It could potentially create some bad odors. We all have to uh, evacuate the room. There's all kinds of different things that could happen based on what are the contents of this bottle. So it's not just, okay, right function, turn over bottle, right function, splash. You can't, it's not possible to account for every possible thing. With C++, the objective is to be able to make objects work together such that when we have an unintended interaction, we can predict it as best as possible through the operations. So on this slide, what I have is an example of a glass of water, a desk, and some pencils. If I spill the water on the computer, it could potentially damage the computer. But it's not, we don't have a function when glass tipped over break, uh, break computer, right? What we have in this object are, if I tip the glass over, what's going to happen? If I have water hit the computer, what's going to happen? And when those two things combine, they should work seamlessly. With the goal here of making the program work properly when it's used in unanticipated ways. And we're going to hit on this idea of message passing. Message passing is us passing information back and forth between objects and classes. All right, so does everybody have a general understanding of what I'm trying to get at for the moment? All right. So how are we going to break these classes down? And how do we think about these ideas? So first, when we have, so what we've learned about in the structure is this idea of properties or members. They are new things you can use to define a specific object. For example, I have this water bottle. It has several different properties. It has color, it has weight, it has a volume it can contain, right? It has a name on it. The electronics cleaner and disinfectant, ZEP, right? All of these things. I get a warning label for external use of vinyl. Okay, let's not set it on fire. Um, there's all kinds of things that I can add as members or properties of that object. But the new thing that we are going to discuss here is this idea of methods. Methods are going to be functions within a class that are acted upon when we call a class object. So for example, when we had that structure, right? When you had to calculate it, you had to access, calculate the final average. You had to access the two members, bring them out in another function and perform the result, right? What if we could write a function, calculate final, that is a method of that student and that all you have to do for the programmer is say, what's their final average? You call final average function, it would be student i dot final average, and then it just returns it for you automatically. This is what's known as a method. And we're gonna see several examples of this later in the semester. 
So I have two examples here. I have a simple example of a student where it has members or properties, their student ID, their GPA, and then I have a method register. So I want to register for classes. It's a function that would dictate to the student how to read in information. And then based on that student's information, we can determine whether or not that student should be allowed to register for specific classes. And putting these all together inside of a class, whether it's the operations that can be done on the data and the data that's used to define the object, putting them all together in a class is known as encapsulation. So we're just encapsulating everything kind of in its own bubble, right? So grouping methods and properties together is known as encapsulation. All right, does anybody have any questions before we continue? Let me quickly check the chat. Right. Next. So some of you are, most of you are probably are sophomores. Some of you are juniors. Some of you are seniors. So registration is different for each of you. Some of you are allowed to register on a certain day. Some of you have to wait until a different day. Some of you have a certain number of credits. Some of you have certain other restrictions. You know, for example, maybe you're doing whenever, if we're ever allowed to leave America again, you get to go to London for NG London, right? You have all these different things that are restrictions based on who the type of student you are. So it's not just enough to define an object. We have to be able to come up with ways to be able to say that we want a student to be able to do a certain thing. So for example, in this register function, I might have a private function called prerequisites. I pass a certain information within the student and it does some work for me. And then it's returned publicly in the register function method. So we can define methods inside of a class to break things down modularity inside the class that can be reused within the class, but cannot be accessed publicly by the programmer. And this is good. We want to remove a lot of the complexity away from the program. For example, when you write fscanf, right? You write an fscanf function, you pass everything by reference, and then some magic happens, right? You didn't need to know what was going on. And then it would return and everything would work. This is the same thing in C++. You, one of the programming paradigms is that you want to hide some of the complexity away from the programmer. And hiding procedural complexity away from the programmer is known as abstraction. If somebody is using your program, and they only need to write, you write three or four lines of code, and it does everything they want it to do, they're gonna love your code, right? Oh, wow, I was able to just call this function and did all this other stuff. I didn't need to write it. So that's one of the things about object-oriented programming is you want to only have the user write what it is that they need to do in order to complete the task. And then you can allow the abstraction in the object to do a lot, a lot of the work for you. So for example, let's say that I'm acting like an idiot and I ignored this warning, right? I have mash and I have my flammable liquid. And I put them together and it ignites, right? The programmer doesn't need to calculate all the chemical equations that are going on underneath in order to determine whether or not it's gonna ignite. We have, we can have a private method that allows us to be able to perform those calculations and then we could return on fire. That abstracts the complexity away from the program. So this is a big uh, paradigm in object-oriented programming. Next thing. Because many of you are sophomores, many of you are juniors, many of you are seniors, you want to do the same task but in a different way. 
which means we don't want to have to re write redundant code for similar classes. So a sophomore, for example, well, so I'm sorry, for a student, you all have registers, you have information for ID, you all have information to keep track of the number of credits you've completed and so on. However, for freshmen, you have some sort of registration function that indicates you have to do stuff for the first year of studies. For sophomores, you want to set your major. Come up with some way to indicate that you are setting your major. And this is something that doesn't need to be done for juniors or seniors in the event, you know, you're not setting your major the first time. You can change your major, which is a different function method entirely. And then with seniors, you have a function to apply for graduation. Now, imagine many of you sophomores want to do that now, but unfortunately, we can't let you. So these classes and methods, we can define them to be unique to each object type. So you can say that a senior is a Notre Dame student, and therefore a senior should have some basic fundamental things that are similar. So we have things that are similar, sophomores, juniors, and seniors that they all have in common. And we can define a base class to have all that information. And then the derived classes will inherit those fundamental things. We call that process of writing multiple classes inheritance. We see here that these classes inheritance the functions of the student, the freshman inherits that basic information. And then what this allows us to do is it allows us to be able to write unique functions for freshmen, for sophomores, for juniors. And the benefit is that we will not have to rewrite these particular methods, which reduces the comp coding complexity. So this is one of those things that we should think about, not just in terms of coding, but in terms of computational thinking in order to be able to describe the world. So here I have considered the case of a registration of a student. We have in procedural programming, we would need an insane number of case statements in order to do this, right? If a student is a senior, can register on March 17th, otherwise a junior, March 21st, sophomore, March 25th, and so on. But what if in each class, these derived classes, I just write its own version? So I say register, if you're a sophomore, you can do this. Register, if you're a junior, you can do this. And we can separate it out in an object-oriented manner. Furthermore, I don't want to have to write a method register sophomore, register junior, register senior. All we're doing is we're registering. But underneath, we can abstract that complexity away. If we rewrite the name of the same function in that new class, in that derived class, we can create another form of it. We're rewriting it. So these functions across these different derived classes can have many forms. And if you go into Greek, that's polymorphism. So that is our fourth term. So the fundamentals, encapsulation, be able to come up with ways, we're going to use this idea of classes to describe ideas, fundamental ideas, and we will encapsulate them together. Second, with object-oriented programming, we want, our, we want a programmer who is using our code to be able to implement this as efficiently as possible without having to do a lot of the back end work. So we want to abstract the complexity of the user. The third one, we want to think about ideas as a base set of ideas and derived ideas. For example, student versus freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And that at first, all of these should have a base idea. In order there, related in ideas, there should be things that they have in common and that the derived ideas should inherit those base ideas. And then fourth, we have to think about these different ideas can have the same type of task, but have variations on the task based on their unique properties. So we would have many forms of this task, which is polymorphic. Does anybody have any questions on this before I continue? 
All right, let me check the chat. Same thing. Okay, so try to come up with wild and crazy ideas like building off of procedural and coming up with object oriented programming. Is anybody who's trying to change things in the world can tell you? Doesn't always go over that terribly well. And, you know, when you're attacking the people who do the previous thing, they tend to not like that. So, Ken Thompson, uh, he responds to this idea of C. This was Ken Thompson is one of the co inventors of C. And he said, if Alan Turing saw C, it would be like if the inventor of the TV came back and saw Maury Povich on the television. So pick your least favorite TV show. That's what he means, right? You're one of those people who doesn't like keeping up with the Kardashians. That's a good one. You know, like USC football. That's another one. Whatever it is, it's just he saw, it said, Alan Turing invented the computer and he would see C++ and go, oh my God, why did you put that on that machine? Didn't like it very much. Linus Torvalds, the inventor of Linux, which we program on to on our, uh, um, when we use the Notre Dame machines. He just straight, straight up C++ is a horrible language. It is made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it. So then Briarne, he responds and says, C++ is designed to allow you to express ideas, but if you don't have any ideas or have any clue how to express them, then C++ doesn't offer much help. So it's a lot of shade going on here. The difference between C and C++ is not just programming, it's philosophical. It's kind of the same way if you look at different uh, actual languages, you know, you're trying to convey an idea in French, versus trying to convey it in German, it can come off in very different ways, right? So C and C++ can be very similar. And so why do I tell you all this? So it's important to do some expectation setting as we transfer from C to C++. For some of you who really enjoy programming in C, you know, like it does it in a very specific way, and I like being told to do things in a very specific way, transferring to C++ can be kind of frustrating because it's a different kind of thinking. Likewise, some of you might, oh, it's just C++, I feel it's very limiting. I do this thing, it does the result, but when I, when I do really cool stuff, and you will enjoy C++, because C++ kind of goes into that type of thinking. And both of those reactions are okay. It's perfectly fine. So the question is, why teach both? The reason why, is empowerment of choice. At some point, when you make a decision about what programming languages you're gonna use, you wanna keep track of several things. The amount of memory it's using, the efficiency of the programming language, and if it's trying to do what it is you need to do. So a lot of pro certain programming languages that have really extensive libraries, for example, Python is a good example. Java is another really good example. Those extensive libraries come with uh, design costs. If you've ever run Java on the Java virtual machine, sometimes you can run really slowly because there's a lot of overhead in order to abstract that complexity away. With C and C++, they're both much closer to the actual machine. So in C, we went to a lot of detail about pointers and how it works to be able to implement things on a certain device. And this is the idea of procedural programming. So now that you understand how the machine works, now you understand what's going on underneath the hood, which is going to make what you're understanding with the object-oriented programming uh, significantly better. Because students who just try to implement the object-oriented programming without that understanding of how the pointers work and how everything's going on in computer architecture, it can, they can really struggle with that. I'll share another Bjarne Strasha quote with you. He said, the thing about, uh, C, if you're bad at programming in C, you'll die a thousand cuts. But if you're uh, bad at programming in C, you could potentially blow your life off. So there's all kinds of ways where C and object range of programming can go very wrongly for you. However, if you understand what's going on procedurally, then you're less likely to run into that challenge. The other crucial thing is robustness. Can we make our program? work with as many possible things as possible. 
So if I'll create an array and uh, data structure that we're going to learn about as we go through this uh, semester, when we have a what's known as a standard template library, C++ has what's known as a dynamic array, which is also known as a vector, which can change the amount of memory that you have allocated to an array as you start adding in more information. How does it do that? It extracts the complexity away from it. So you keep putting them in there and then some magic happens and then you're still able to access that information just like it's a normal array and everybody's happy, right? So ultimately computing is a philosophy and programming is an implementation of that philosophy. As you're starting to work on more and more of these assignments and you're starting to, you know, gain familiarity with different programming languages, maybe you code in embedded systems, maybe you're familiar with Python, maybe you're familiar with Java, you're eventually going to develop your own philosophy of programming. And that's ultimately what introduction to computing and this idea of computational thinking draws down to. You have the empowerment of choice to determine which programming language you should use for a task which ones you are the most comfortable with and how it is that you want to accomplish your goals. Oh, skip over that. Okay, so does anybody have any questions before I actually start digging into what it is that C++ actually is? Okay, let me check the chat as well. Okay, so, oh. So let's go all the way back to Hello World. So C++ is Hello World, it's a little different than C. First, in C, they have a library called standardio.h, right? And when we learned about building our own libraries, we used .h files to store that information. And we're still going to do the same thing in C++, except when we can include libraries, you're going to find that most of them don't have a dot H at the end. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to use IO stream as our first library. Input output stream, like stdio.h is standard IO. Now standard IO stream can be much more robust in terms of including libraries for us to be able to read in and output information. And we're going to use, instead of f print f, our output stream is going to be called c out. And we're going to use standard c out to be able to read information to the output. And then what's going to happen is we're going to be able to put variables and objects in a line to output how we want them. So this eliminates the need for output specifiers. So no more of this percent D, percent P, percent LF, none of that. What this is going to do is it's going to automatically include the output specifier for the variable for you. So we're already seeing a simple example of abstraction. In C, we had to dictate using F printf the precise number of characters we need to allocate on the data key which we would then print out. C++ is going to abstract a lot of this complexity away for us. So let me show you. First, I'm going to review and show you hello in .c. So we remember from hello.c all the way back to standard io.h. And we had the standard out. When we went through and we put all these characters, I have this backslash n. In hello.cpp, instead of using standard IO, we're using IO stream. And then we have standard out. And then we have hello world. And then we have this end line, standard end line, ENDL. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just run a compilation, make hello cpp and then run it. 
And it just prints out the same thing as we've done before. But now instead of having to constantly do output specifiers, it's a little easier to modify. So if I say hello world, and then I were to do another space here, right? Actually, even better, I'll just say int temp is equal to five, right? And if I say hello world and put a space, and then I just put temp here, like so, does everybody see that? When I print this out, it's gonna say hello world five. So it has abstracted its output specifiers away from us. We have been able to put two different objects of which the IO stream has interpreted as a string and an int for us. Does everybody see that? Yes. Yes. So the follow up question is Does so C is a superset? Of C. So I could actually do this. I could actually do f printf standard out hello again. And let's see what happens. Let's see. You do not. And the reason why is because the IO stream is a superset of the library of standard IO. So you can do both. And so the question is to kind of go further, when would I want to do both? So the thing that as with everything in life and particularly in programming, there's pros and cons. So the pro of this is that the more variables I add, it's a lot easier, right? If I want to do this in F printf, I'd have to do hello again, percent D, and then I have to do comma temp, right? And this will print everything out. And I'll show you everything with the make file in a bit. However, let's say I wanted to have a very specific uh, four, and let's say this is 15, right? Now notice how it's created the spaces. So in C, we can make this much more accurate. You can do, there are libraries that will allow you to do this in C++, but they're pretty complex. It's called standard, uh, so you can do set precision, but then you have to change it for every single object that you put in. So one of the reasons why I'm following up on your question in more detail is because sometimes if you need it to be very precise on the output, some programmers will say, okay, I'm going to default back to the C library in order to get out a very specific set of outputs. Right, so let me undo all these changes. We see the comparison here. So now what I want to do is now tell you some of the changes we're going to make to our make files in order to compile in C++. So a lot of the files are going to be the same because again, C++ is a super set of C. So a lot of these flags that we will enforce for C will also be effective for C++. However, there are certain things that we need to do in C++. In C++, we have to specify the type of architecture. So if you remember when we, uh, earlier this semester, I ran this command lscpu, right? And when I ran it, it told us all this information about the computer and that one of the things it told us was CPU operation mode. And it could be in 32 or 64 bits. In C++, we should dictate in order to preserve data accuracy, which operation mode we want. So in this case, you will see that I have M dash dash M64. The next thing is instead of the standard C2011, I'm going to the C++ standard 2011 flag. And then the third one is this 
effective C++. Now, for those of you at the beginning of the semester here asking me, what are some good books that you wanted to, uh, that you should get that are optional, but would be very helpful for you in the future? There is a book by Scott Myers called Effective C++, which has 55 really good rules to follow in order to write really strong code. And this was so well regarded that the um, ISO, the International Standard Organization, actually created another C++, C++ compiler flag that enforced all of these rules. Now, most of these are going to be in advanced classes. And we will encounter only a couple of them. But I'll get your question in a second. But they are essential to be to have really good programming. So this, uh, and when we get to these particular reasons why we want to have this particular flag, I will discuss them in detail. Yes. All right, so advanced class means, well, first of all, anything that I would teach in data structures. So for example, um, if I were building a, I'll just say what I'm going to do in class today. If we are building a red black tree, and that is an advanced type of binary search tree that does what we did in bird sort and it stores all the information. For to have a good red black tree, I have to do something we're going to learn about in this course called template. When you template and you store dynamic memory, which is reallocation of memory, you then have to meet what is known as the rule of three. You have to do constructor, destructor, and assignment operator. We're going to touch on those a little bit towards the very end of this semester. But in order to go that in a lot more detail and for specific rules about specifically how to pass uh, node pointers by with a call by reference to do that efficiently, that's where those will be really come in. Are there any other questions? Let me check the chat first. Okay, so let me take you into the make file to show you how I'm compiling both of these files simultaneously. So I have the make file here. And now we're going into our compiler directives. So for C, the compiler is GCC. And for G++, the GCC compiler is G++. So for the flags, all of these flags that I currently have highlighted are the same. They will work the exact same in C and in C++. For the C flags, I have standard 2011 and then that flags afterwards. And then in C++, which I call CXX here, I have the architecture flag, 2011 C++ standard, and the effective C++ flag, and then I have all the other flags following after that. So from there, I have a make file that I can use to compile both C and C++ code. So here I have the compilation for C. You see that I have the CC and C flags dash O hello, hello objects. They're all familiar, we've all done that several times this semester. Now, if I do hello.cpp, you'll see that it's the exact same template in the exact same format, except I've replaced that with the G++ variable and the CXX flags variable. But it, otherwise, it's the exact same thing. Does everybody see that? So then, because of this, I can say, all right, uh, clear make hello, and I have a C file in this library and I can run it and it runs fine. And then I make hello CPP and I can run a C++ file in the exact same way using the exact same make file. And so if you have different for different, so there's a lot of times when you might want to mix languages based on having a specific language do a specific aspect of the program. And you can build make files to compile everything and put them all together in a way that works for you.
Okay. So then if you want to review this later. Here's the animation where I just talked about the same thing I've done before. And I compile and run everything. Okay, so IO stream. Let's go into a little more detail about how this works. This is quick. So I have a file here, output.cpp, where we're doing things a little more complicated. So we see that I have an integer and a float. And then my first line is standard out, standard C out. And then this line will have two end of line characters after it. And I see I have the new, I still have the end of line character there, right? And then I have another end of line. So you can do this in several different ways. So there's several different ways to do a new line character. Another one we could do is care 10. Does anybody remember why I could do that? Yes, it's backslash and in ASCII representation. Very good. So this is just several different ways of saying the exact same thing. So now here, I'm printing out the values R and I'm printing out the actual values themselves. And then I have this next line where I say the addresses are and I'm gonna print out the register locations. No more casting to void pointer, no more percent P, I want the address of the registers, I can just do that, and the object-oriented programming language will do the work for me. That's a little bit of abstraction. So if I run make output, there we go, that looks better. You see that I have 26 and negative 6.2, and then I have the addresses of those registers printed out. Yes. Yes. You should also specify like I want to I print out what the D records by this whole process. Correct. And you should specify the records. Absolutely. Yeah. So we because so now we can take away that void pointer specification. So it's a little less complicated to code. Object oriented programming does the work for us. Hey, does anybody have any other questions? Okay, so next thing, pass by reference. So in C, in order to pass by reference, we have had a function that we wanted to pass to. We need to do one of two things. If we passed an array, so for example, just a character array, for strings, or we were passing a just a, a, a you know, multi-dimensional array, it passed it by reference by default, right? In C++, that's still the same. We have we're gonna as we get to C++ arrays, we're gonna see that it's, we have to do it a little differently because in the object-oriented programming, it's going to demand that we maintain some data integrity. And we're eventually going to learn about this C++ is, is this idea of a strongly typed language. But in short, what we had to do is if we had to pass an integer by reference, what I had to do is I had to do int star, right? And then if I wanted to get that value, I had to dereference it there, correct? And if I want to save it or grab that information, that's what I had to do. In C++, they have this new concept called call by reference. And the objective of call by reference is to copy the reference of an argument into the formal parameter. And then once you have this done, you can make modifications by writing the code as though it's local. The objective of call by reference is to simplify the process of passing a variable to a function and modifying that variable. Now, this is another one of those things that if it's a little confusing when I show it to you the first time, do not hesitate to raise your hand. And don't get me wrong, I don't, don't hesitate to raise your hand ever. But in this case, 
If it looks a little confusing and you don't get it the first time, bring the class to a screeching halt. It's perfectly fine. So before I show you call by reference, I want you to think of call by reference as taking out the middle. What we're going to do is instead of saying int star x, we're going to say int ampersand x. And then inside, instead of saying having to dereference it, I can just make the changes without having to do anything to the variable. And if I make a change to it, it will automatically make the change. And then when we leave the function scope, that change will be preserved. And the benefit, as we'll see in a moment, is that using the variable name in the function gives the variable, not the address. So remember if I, with pass by reference, if I had int star x, and if I did print f, it would give me the address of the variable. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. So first, let me bring up, okay, so it's called pointer.cpp. Now first, let me go to main. And in main, I create two variables, temp x and temp y. And when we did pass by reference in C, I had to create pointers, pointer x and pointer y, right? And to pass by reference, I had to do those pointers. The other way I could have done this is I could have gone ampersand temp x, ampersand temp y. The crucial thing is when I did pass by reference, I had to pass the address of the function, I mean, of, of the variable. Does that make sense so far? So before I go into call by reference, I'm going to show you as a review what we were doing in pass by reference. So here I passed pointer to x and a pointer to temp y. And then I print out the addresses and that's the address of the local register. The address is pointed to by temp x and temp y is the value inside that variable, just like before. Except in C++, we do not need to cast a void star. So we're still doing the same thing, going back to the hungry puppy analogy. The address of temp x and address of temp y and pointer is the location where the dog is thinking. The address pointed to by, so Aaron was looking, she was looking at the hand that had food in it, right? So that's the, that's the temp x and temp y that I currently have highlighted. And then dereferencing it, temp star temp x and star temp y is when I revealed the cheats. Everybody remember that? So now let's take a look at this idea of call by reference and see how it's different. In call by reference, you see I have temp x and temp y. And then call by reference, I'm just calling them. I don't have to do any ampersand. I don't have to allocate any pointers. I don't have to do any of that. Does everybody see that so far? And the reason I'm able to do this with the call by reference in C++ is that in this function, I do int ampersand temp x and int ampersand temp y. And from there, I have a call by reference example, but I want to say the address of temp x and temp y. And so that's the hand. I can say ampersand temp x and ampersand temp y. And then values, I can just use the values as though it's being written normally in main. And so what you will see is when I run this, it's going to do a pass by reference call and a call by reference function call. And the thing that you will notice is that the address at this line at 40, where it's saying ampersand temp x, because it's being called by reference, this gives me the location. That is the same thing in pass by reference when I say address is pointed to by temp x and temp y. You're going to see that in the three lines, that in the middle line in pass by reference is going to be the same thing as the addresses of the first line in call by reference. So let me run the compilation.
make pointer. Then we're gonna run it and run clear, and then pointer itself. And so to conclude lecture, here's the difference between the procedural pass by reference, where I have to pass these addresses of the registers, right? And then to get the information, I have to go inside the registers and get them from this location. And then these are the dereferenced values. And that's temp X and temp Y in pass by uh, reference. And when I call by reference, when I do that appersand, you'll see that these addresses are the same, which means when I do appersand temp X and appersand temp Y, when I call by reference, this means I am getting the address where the variables are located, which means that I've cut out the middleman. And then when I just say temp X and temp Y, I just get the values themselves. So the objective of call by reference is to treat variables that are passed by reference as objects in order to abstract coding complexity from the program. Does everybody see that? Okay, so this is where we'll conclude for today. And then we're gonna pick up on more C++ on Wednesday.